All right, well, welcome to How to Confidently Hire the Right Person Every Time Using the HireWorks Process. I'm HireWorks Process creator John Weisenberger, and I've been hiring and managing people for over 30 years. First, as an engineering manager, then as a sales and marketing manager, and lastly, as a general manager in a couple of different industries. I've hired engineers, product managers, customer service reps, sales reps, and just about every type of manufacturing employee, either personally or through one of my line managers. And yes, I'll admit I've made a few bad hires in my career, including an engineer who couldn't code and a quality manager who was always absent. So let me ask you, what if you could confidently make the right hiring decisions time after time? What if you had a way to gauge the true fit, character, attitude, determination, and even team orientation of each candidate that applies for one of your open positions? What would your organization's culture and bottom line look like a year from now if you only hired A players? These are the questions keeping business owners and their managers up at night, and I know because I've been there. Fortunately, I've learned from my bad hire experiences, and that's why I created the HireWorks process, so others like you don't have to make the same mistakes I've made. So what is the HireWorks process, and, and who is it for? Well, the HireWorks process is a unique three-phase, nine-step system that helps anyone involved in the recruitment and selection of new employees quickly improve their interviewing skills and hiring decision confidence. You know, most people find recruiting and hiring new employees challenging and extremely time-consuming. And every manager worries about hiring the wrong person, and it's understandable as almost every manager is only a part-time recruiter and interviewer. You know, recruiting and interviewing is just something you do from time to time, and it's really not your day job, right? So what will you learn during this webinar? Well, this training is designed to help you address three big issues. So in this webinar, you're going to learn how to recruit the right fit candidates, and we'll talk about what the definition of right fit is in a moment. It's going to teach you how to save time processing candidates, so everything becomes more efficient from recruiting to interviewing to offering and onboarding. It's going to teach you how to reduce the offer rejections that you might get from going through the interview process, finding your best candidate, and making them an offer and then have them not accept it. And it's also going to help you lower your retention risk that once someone does accept your offer, that they will actually stick around and do the job for a long time. So this training will help you improve all three phases of the recruiting and hiring process. So let's begin our training with phase number one of the HireWorks process and learning how to recruit the right fit candidates. So what do we mean by right fit candidates? Well, the right fit candidate will be individuals capable of coping with your work environment and your company culture, and they'll be able to do the job for at least a year and preferably longer. And, you know, as I said, there's no point hiring someone and then see them quit after a few weeks. Now, most people can cope with any type of work environment for a few weeks or months, but that's not what you want. You don't want employees just coping with a role. You want them thriving and you want them excited about their role and your company's success. Now, unfortunately, only a minority of personality types can really cope with any type of work environment for years on end without quitting. And your recruiting and interviewing task as a hiring manager is to find those right type of individuals who are a perfect match for the type of job in the type of work environment your company provides. Now, another attribute of the right fit candidate is that they'll also be able to learn to do the job to a high standard. Now, I know it's great when you're recruiting that you find a candidate that matches a position, but I want you to keep in mind many excellent candidates are often ignored because they don't have enough experience or the exact skills for the position when in reality, some skills can be learned quite quickly on the job. Now, hiring individuals with the perfect resume could see you make a quicker hire, 
but perhaps it'll result in a quick turnover if the candidate is lacking in some other areas, which I'll talk more about in a minute. So I'm merely raising your awareness right now that the cost of a quick hiring decision, uh, when you're solely looking at the exact skills and experience of someone's resume, well, that cost it could be a reduced candidate pool because you're limiting other good candidates, and it has a high potential for causing a rapid turnover if that candidate really doesn't fit your culture and your organization. So remember, even Tom Brady was the 199th pick in the sixth round of the 2000 NFL draft. So it isn't always someone who on paper looks great. Uh, it could be someone who has the potential to do the job long term. So there's more things involved in just the skills and experience that you'll find on a, a person's resume. And lastly, the right candidate isn't going to adversely affect the performance of anyone else they work with. And if you get the right candidate, it may actually increase your overall team's performance. So you really want to avoid people that could be disruptive because there's little point in them being good at their job if they also adversely affect the performance of the other people around them. And, you know, you really want to have someone that can bring um, a sense of synergy to the overall performance and increase the overall performance of your team. So let me ask you, which candidate is most important when you're recruiting? Is it skills or is it attitude? And just to remind you, an attitude is a behavior. It's something in the person's nature as opposed to something they learn. So I think, you know, the answer to this whole question is attitude is more important than the person's uh, skills. And that's because as managers, we typically hire on those skills we see on a resume, and then we end up firing the person because of their attitude. So... One of the problems with the traditional hiring process is that although attitudes clearly matter more than skills, we tend to hire only on the skills we see on their resumes. And this is usually one of the reasons we find it difficult to hire the right fit people. So how can we predict the right fit and what their performance is going to be before we hire an individual? You know, we really need a way to predict who will be good at the job and who will not be good at the job, and who will stick it out for years, and who won't, and who's going to get along with the existing team, and who's not going to get along. So let's look at some of the standard ways we usually try to predict performance. And what are those standard ways? Well, usually we try to look at their work experience, and we look at the skills they have on the resume and the qualifications of their, uh, you know, their education or their licensing, you know, certifications they have. We look at things that are in these three categories. And what are we really hoping to learn during an interview that the resume or the employment application won't tell us? You know, surely all the information we need is provided on the candidate's application and their resume, right? And if it's only about skills and work experience and qualifications, then why do we bother interviewing candidates at all? We just pick whoever looks best on paper. Well, that's why we interview candidates, because we really want to discover who the individual is as a person. And interviews, in a nutshell, are really just personality assessments. You know, we use personality assessments because we want to know who the candidate is and not just what they've done or what they say they can do. So if personality didn't matter, then we wouldn't bother interviewing people. We'd just rely on the resumes and their employment applications to give us all the data that we're looking for. So if you think about it, in reality, you've been using your own internal intuitive personality assessment skills each time you interview a candidate. The problem is your internal intuition isn't always very reliable. Fortunately, there is a better way. And that way is software, in particular, the Big Five assessment software that we use as part of the HireWorks process. So 
We use a custom software platform called Big Five Assessments, and it performs a variety of psychometric assessments on candidates to make sure that they have all these right fit attitudes, behaviors, and that they have the cognitive skills required for a specific job role. So it's a very important part of the HireWorks process and, and actually our secret sauce that will help you identify all those right fit attitudes that you don't get on a resume or CV. Now, the Big Five assessment software has benchmarks for the personality traits and the level of cognitive abilities and the behavioral attitudes for a wide range of job positions and skill sets that will allow you to look for the right fit candidates for your open position. So currently, our library has over 130 job benchmarks available, and we're adding more all the time. Now, each of these benchmark assessments, they, they go into much more depth than our own human intuitive skills can provide us. And these benchmarks are scientifically proven to be more reliable. So let's talk about each of the assessment areas in a bit more detail. So the first assessment we use is called the Five Factors Personality Assessment. Now, the Big Five Five Factors Personality Assessment is considered by most psychologists as the most accurate and valid personality assessment in use today. Now, you may have heard about others such as Myers-Briggs or the DISC assessments, but the Big Five Five Factors Assessment is considered the gold standard of personality assessments. So, what is actually measured by the Big Five? Well, when, a, when you look at the different personality traits, it's number one, we look at conscientiousness versus having a carefree attitude. And that'll kind of describe the degree to which the individual is persistent at their job, how they get motivated, how well organized they are, and how disciplined and dependable they're going to be in that position. The second thing that we measure is what's called likability uh, versus being a tough-minded uh, individual. And that kind of describes the degree to which the person is a pleasant and agreeable person and how they can range from being warm and tolerant and tactful to being tough-minded, uh, skeptical, and direct. So again, very much an important attribute of how well they're going to get along with other people, whether they're direct and tough-minded and skeptical and kind of uh, rough versus being more pleasant and agreeable. Now, the third thing that is measured is called unconventional versus uh, rules-oriented, and that kind of describes the degree to which the individual is predictable, how often they follow rules and structure, and how well they like following rules and structure, um, as opposed to being open to trying new things and being adventuresome and, and inconsistent. So again, you want to look for the type of attributes you would need when you're interviewing an individual for a specific position. So an example would be if you're looking for a quality manager, you want somebody that's probably rules-oriented and structured and wants to see every I and T dotted in the correct order versus if you're looking for a innovated, innovative uh, process guru that's looking at restructuring your operations or you're looking for a marketing person that's looking a creative way to drive more leads and close more sales, you want somebody that's more open to new ideas and more adventuresome, let's call it. The fourth attribute of the Big Five is called extroversion versus introversion. And, you know, that describes the focus of an individual's emotional energy, ranging from being the outgoing, uh, dominant, boisterous, ambitious, and, and sociable type of person versus being an introverted, shy, and quiet person. So, again, you might want an engineer. You don't care if they're introverted, shy, and want to work alone versus if you want a salesperson, uh, you want somebody that has a little more uh, outgoing personality and, you know, is gung-ho about closing deals, right? And then the last of the big five attributes is called stability, and that's versus being a sensitive, neurotic type of person that um, 
might be more sensitive and anxious all the time. So are you looking for the degree of an individual's emotional stability? So, you know, are they resistant to stress? Um, are they calm and self-confident, again, versus being sensitive and anxious all the time, right? So these are what's considered the five factors, big five attributes that are measured, and uh, they can tell you a lot about an individual candidate. Now, with the big five uh, assessment software, there's actually two more attributes that we measure that can tell you uh, about their teaming capabilities. And, and what that really measures is the applicant's attitude towards teamwork versus being an individual contributor. And again, it depends on the type of role you're looking to fill. You know, if you want a salesperson, in the end of the day, all salespeople are individual uh, contributors. They don't really work as part of a team when they're trying to sell a particular client. Whereas if you're looking at someone who is part of an engineering group or um, a part of a, a marketing group, you know, you might want people that can collaborate to put together a promotional program uh, for marketing or an engineering. You want people that can collaborate on a large piece of software to figure out who's going to do what. So again, this team measurement is an additional scale that the Big Five assessment software measures, and I think you'll find its report very uh, interesting. And then lastly, everyone always asks about the validity of the test. So we incorporate what's called the Good Impression Scale, and it's really a validity testing scale that measures the degree to which the person has responded openly and frankly to the assessment questions and this good impression scale can give you an indication of how much the person has tried to manipulate the assessment results. So if they're trying to put in the answer that they think you want, uh, it's going to call them out on that and it'll be able to figure it out and give you an accurate reading for how much did they try to manipulate the results. So this is what the big five assessments personality questionnaire figures out for you and it's probably the most fundamental and key part of the whole HireWorks process is getting to know the person uh, from the big five attribute perspective. Now, the second thing we measure with the software is what's called a cognitive ability test because research has confirmed that the best predictor of job performance is a person's cognitive ability. And, how easily and quickly the candidate will be able to solve problems and process information re related to the role. So the cognitive ability assessment reveals how easily the candidate's going to be able to adapt to new changes and absorb and grasp new concepts, as well as if you're looking for someone involved in some kind of process improvement opportunity, you're going to want someone that has the cognitive ability to see how things could be done differently and understand the whole process and not just be someone who has been trained to do step after step after step. You want someone who can see those steps and find maybe a way to improve them. So for most jobs, and it depends on the role, there's a range of cognitive ability associated with being successful in that position. And what matters is the fit with the requirements of the job. You don't need a rocket scientist to do a particular job if the job is not launching rockets into space, I suppose, right? Okay, so the last thing we typically assess with the Big Five assessment software is called the attitude assessment. Research also demonstrates that honesty and integrity testing can help you predict any counterproductive workplace behaviors. So this type of assessment will let you screen out applicants with attitudes and behaviors that could be or could lead to problems with product shrinkage, aka theft. It could help find someone who might have excessive absenteeism because they're not conscientious about showing up to work and their attitude would show that, you know, they don't care if they arrive 10 minutes late or not. It could show you if there's any inappropriate behaviors that might be present in their personality and, and show up in the place of work. 
and it also could give you an indication of are you going to have to fire this individual for having a bad attitude and some behaviors that are not good. So this attitude assessment is a very important assessment that can identify any red flags that you might need to explore during an interview or perhaps it would even eliminate a candidate from any consideration of even being interviewed as part of the initial filtering. So the attitude assessment is to me just as important as the other two, the cognitive and the personality. And the big five assessment software gives you reports on all three of these very important areas. Okay, so that was it for phase one. Let's move on and talk about phase two of the higher works process. So in phase two, we're going to talk about how can you save time processing candidates and make your whole hiring process more efficient. So let's consider a scenario where you have 20 or 30 candidate resumes and employment applications, and you need to try to figure out which candidates are you going to interview first or are you going to interview at all. That maybe you're going to eliminate some of that 20 or 30 candidates. So here's how we go about doing it with the fireworks process. The fireworks process begins by inviting every applicant that applies for your job to a series of those psychometric assessments that we just talked about. So when you're implementing your hiring process and your recruiting funnel, only candidates who respond to the assessment invitation within the specified time frame, and you're going to establish a time frame, typically seven to 10 days for them to complete their assessments, uh, but only those candidates will be invited to an actual telephone interview, or maybe you'll use Zoom and, and do a Zoom call interview. So let's talk about the steps you'll take to create that filter. So the first step is picking the job fit benchmark that you're going to use, and you'll pick one that most closely resembles the position being recruited. And it, it doesn't have to be an exact match. So for example, if the role will be managing people, then you could just use the general manager and team leader benchmark. So each assessment for a particular job benchmark covers the issues that affect that job role. For instance, a manager and team leader assessment focuses on delegation and leadership style. So the topics are only relevant to the role where the individual will be delegating or, or leading people if you use that job benchmark. Now, if you're unsure about which benchmark to use, you can discuss it with your HR representative or you can contact your HireWorks pro like me who can help you with your selection. And in some cases where the job you're recruiting has some very special requirements and is very unique, it may be necessary to have a custom benchmark created. And that's something we can do and we would work with you as well to create that custom benchmark, which, you know, again, you can contact me and we can discuss your needs and figure out if you need a custom benchmark or if you can use some benchmark that already exists. Alternatively, we do have a general other category benchmark that you can use if there's no standard benchmark available for your specific position. So that would just show you the candidate's scores relative to the general population of the thousands of individuals who've taken the big five assessments over the years. So regardless of the method you use, after you've selected the best job benchmark for your open position, you're going to create what's called an assessment event based on that job benchmark. You're going to create this assessment event, which is uh, an invitation to taking the assessments. And then you're going to invite every applicant you want to assess to the position's event using the event UR link, um, as I point to and show you here. So as we showed in the funnel, you're probably going to want to invite every person that applies for the position to this event. And that way you can then have the assessment results for all those people and figure out who you're going to want to invite to a phone interview. 
Now, I will tell you, in my experience, the assessment of vetting invitation is going to eliminate about 90% of the applicants who won't actually take or complete the assessment. And that's going to give you a productivity increase, and it'll keep you from wasting your time on the phone interviewing people who aren't really interested in your position. In fact, some people just uh, apply for jobs so they can show in their unemployment records that they applied for multiple positions and were actively searching for new employment. So again, you want to invite all the people at the top of the funnel who have applied for the position, but you're not going to get everyone to complete the event. And in my experience, you're going to lose nine out of 10, but those are nine that you didn't want to interview anyway. So out of that remaining 10%, those are the people you're going to filter and decide in which order you want to interview each of the candidates on the phone before you would invite them into an in-person interview, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So before you do any of the interviews, one of the very important things you also need to figure out is you're going to need to figure out in your collaboration with your whole hiring team, or if you're a sole hiring manager, then by yourself, but you're going to have to establish what's called what we call a minimum acceptable job fit score for the position. So as you can see here on this slide, this individual has a 96% job fit score. So for the position this individual was assessed against, they scored very high at 96%. There was a low concern about any behavioral attitude problems, uh, so very good attitude was exhibited in the assessment. They have uh, low job engagement, which we didn't talk about that, but engagement for the job is the measurement against their current job at their past employer and how engaged were they in doing that job. So maybe they were working on a shipping dock and really didn't care much about shipping, and this engagement would show you that if you were looking to hire this person to work on your shipping dock, uh, they probably wouldn't have much motivation to work for you either. And then the last one that talks about employer engagement, that just shows you how much they were engaged and cared about the employer they were working for. And for this individual, they were kind of at the average level. So they really didn't you know, care one way or the other about the success of the prior company they were working for. So when you look at these uh, assessment results for this individual, very good candidate. Now, it's important to remember that when you're establishing this minimal, minimum, I should say, acceptable job fit score, it should be a function of the role's criticality to the business and or the safety of others. So for example, you may only want candidates scoring 90 or above for an ICU nurse, whereas candidates for a shipping clerk may only require a minimum score of 75. So it's a judgment call. You don't want to eliminate a lot of good candidates by send, setting the bar too high. But on the other hand, for a certain type of position, you may want to make sure that you only have the very best uh, in the 90th percentile. So we could talk more about that. And again, as a HireWorks Pro uh, consultant, I'd be happy to help you guys figure out the right level. Now, lastly... After the assessment event response deadline that you established is reached, then you'll have all the applicant assessments and you'll be able to filter the job fit scores for those uh, assessments and prioritize and build your initial list of candidates that will receive invitations to a phone interview. And as you can see by this slide, there's a lot of people who had a lot of good scores but had some serious concerns about their attitude or things that made them less of a good candidate. So out of all these people that completed the assessment, you've got five of them here that had good scores above the 86th percentile and didn't have any concerns about attitude. So these would be the first five people you'd want to interview and if you did interview someone with a serious concern or some concern, 
then you would want to make sure you had questions during the interview that could help you decide whether that red flag was really uh, a problem or not. Okay, so now we've prioritized your list and it's time to interview candidates. So in step number one of the phone interview process, you're going to conduct a 30-minute Zoom or telephone interview with each screened candidate that you prioritized using the interview questionnaire that you can find as part of your HireWorks process package. Now, this simple questionnaire has been developed to keep this 30-minute phone interview on track and to provide a consistent set of questions for each candidate that you interview. And that way, you'll have specific questions that you can compare the results of these phone interviews. So the phone interview questionnaire doesn't delve into the specific personality assessment results for each candidate. The phone interview questionnaire has more of a generic set of questions that you can use to decide if the candidate gets to be brought in for a traditional, more detailed in-person interview. So let's look at a couple of questions on the questionnaire. It's like, can you give an overview of your experience with this type of role? What attracted you to our company and this specific role? And can you describe a challenging project or situation you've encountered in a previous role and how you handled it? So they're pretty generic questions. There's only five of them, but you'll see how those five questions are used a little later in the process here. And this is where you will take and assess what the response was. So one of the other parts of the HireWorks process is the concept of scorecards for interviews. And this is an example of the telephone interview scorecard. And when you look at it, you'll see there's a section for rating how the candidate answered questions one through five of the actual phone interviews. And then there's also a section where you can fill in the results of all the big five software assessment uh, that the candidate took. So it's a comprehensive form that will let you capture all the results of the phone interview Plus, it gives you a snapshot of how they did on their assessments, just for reference. So next, once you look at that and you decide, okay, I've got all my phone interviews done, and here's the group of candidates that I want to bring in for in-person, I'm going to send them an invitation to a in-person interview. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to use an online calendar of your choice and that will save you time, you know, playing phone tag or working back and forth through emails to figure out when each of you are available for the interviews. So you're going to use a calendar kind of like Calendarly or Time Trade or even a Google Calendar, but you'll work or we'll work together if you'd like to set up how to use a online calendaring system to schedule these in-person interviews, but this will save you a heck of a lot of time. And the task of actually scheduling the interview now falls on the candidate's shoulders instead of yours. So I think that's a big part of saving time is putting the challenge of finding a time that works for everybody. It, it actually eliminates that challenge because the times that you're available is on the online calendar and the candidate can pick from the available slots that are still open for interviews on the calendar. So it's another good test of the candidate to see can they follow instructions that are in your email that invites them. So how well do they follow and pay attention to the details of the instructions? And it'll also show you do they have the computer skills to use an online calendar, right? And perhaps lastly, it will show you do they have enough interest in the job to do the work to schedule the interview. So this is an important part of the productivity improvements that you'll get by using the HireWorks process and all the steps and things we ask you uh, to do or recommend you do to have a complete end-to-end -end hiring process. Okay, so now you've 
you're ready to hold your first in-person interviews, so it's important to think about how you're going to hold them and the type of environment you'll be presenting to the candidates. Because, again, it's important to know that that can have a big impression on the candidate and um, can help make sure that they're going to want to work for you if you decide to choose them. So, I think it's important to, to recognize this fact because anyone who is scheduled for an interview with a prospective employer is likely to be experiencing some anxiety and apprehension. In fact, statistics show that less than 20% of the general population cope well with traditional interviews. This means most people you see are at a disadvantage and are not going to come across as their best in those interviews. So, Remember, making a good hiring decision is made by having good data. And interviews are all about getting the candidate to provide you with that good data. They're not about showing the candidate how smart or experienced you are. And it's not about trying to catch them in some way. So when you put together your interview plan for each candidate, some of the things I want you to keep in mind are Number one, ensure you're available at the scheduled time. The candidate's going to go through the process of scheduling their interview using your online calendar. And and when they show up, you want to make sure you're available and not in some other meeting or have forgotten about it. You're going to want to personally welcome the applicant to the location and introduce yourself. You're going to want to show them to the interview location where you're not going to be interrupted Uh, You might want to give them something to drink or ask them if they'd like something. And you're going to want to make sure that, in general, that they're comfortable. Okay, so after you've thought about the appropriate interview format and the type of interview you're going to hold, whether it's panel or one-on-one, the HireWorks process has an interview plan template that will capture all the information of who, what, where, and when the interview is going to happen. And and you can use this form to capture and relay that information to everyone involved in the interview. So I wanted to show you a a sample of that form here. So next we're going to talk about how do you conduct the actual interview. So prior to conducting the interview, you're going to want to review each candidate's job fit report and the example questions that it provides to refresh your understanding of each candidate's personality strengths and weaknesses. So in fact, when you're talking with the candidate, you can mention to them, if you want to, that you're looking at their assessment job fit report, and you can tell them where they place for a specific attribute. You could also read the description of the results for each of those attributes and say, do you think these results really describe you? Do you think they should be higher or lower? But whatever their answer is, ask them to explain and expand on on the answer to the question, right? Ask them for examples from their past employers to support their answers. So remember, this, this is all about getting them to open up and reveal something more about themselves And by using the job report here, it'll help prepare you for remembering the type of person and things that are behavioral and personality attributes for this particular candidate. And it'll also give you one question on the job fit report. And then if you also want, you can also, with that job fit report, it'll give you several more specific interview questions that you can use relative to that role. So between the basic job fit report and the additional questions that you have, you'll have a lot of ways to explore various results of that job fit report. So when you use the extra report here, it's unlikely you're going to have time to get through all the various questions, but it's a good report and form that allows you to ask a few more questions and actually has a place where you can uh, re, you can rate the participant's response, whether it's good, fair, excellent, whatever. Lastly, the, the HireWorks process also provides an optional template for creating a complete candidate interview guide. So 
this guide is a comprehensive collection of all the candidates' resume information. It's uh, uh, combined with the job fit reports, and it's a way to put in one package a complete guide that you can give to the members of your interview team, and it'll let them uh, have everything in one place. But it is optional. It's this one, this template's about 24 pages, and uh, you could make it, you know, more detailed or less detailed. The only thing I would recommend, though, is that you review this with the members of your interview team before they actually perform an interview because you don't really want uh, people on your team all picking the same question off the guide to ask the individual. So anyway, it's available and can be quite useful to capture everything in one place. A more important and useful tool is the form that you use to hold a record of what we call a candidate assessment meeting. And again, this is all explained in the standard operating procedure, the SOP, that we also provide you for the hire works process. And uh, what you do with this is you can use it to compare the notes from your interview and decide who to invite back for a second round interview. And again, I've always recommended everybody that you do hold uh, two rounds of in-person interviews. I don't care what the position is from a janitor to a CEO. You really need to take two in-person interviews with everybody if you really want to get people that are the right fit and will stick around and people that you don't have to replace because you made a judgment call after just meeting the person once. Now, I don't really have time in this presentation to cover how to do all that in detail. However, the example SOP document that we give you for the HireWorks process explains what to do, and I'd be happy to hold a separate training that walks you through the entire example SOP if anyone is interested. So just let me know in the comments section below this video. So next, in step eight, you're going to send out a second round interview invitation that also includes a request to provide three employment-related references. So at this point in the process, you've already done phone interviews, you've done a first round of in-person interviews with the candidate, you know quite a bit about them. It didn't make any sense to ask them to provide their references earlier than this. Now they may have, they, they may have given you three sets of references on their resume, but you know, quite often, depending on the type of position, people might have referenced a brother-in-law or a friend of theirs or the pastor of their church, and you're not looking for that. You're looking for employment references from their prior supervisors or someone that they actually worked with. So if they haven't provided those, again, this is a reminder that they need to bring them with them to the second round in-person interview or at minimum email them to you before. But as you're going to see in the SOP, we actually put the burden of scheduling those phone calls and reference check phone calls on the burden we put the burden on the shoulder of the candidate by, again, using an online calendar where they've arranged a call with their reference and they schedule it on your calendar at a time slot you've made available. So again, as far as process improvement, the hire works process will put that burden back on the candidate. And we think, again, it shows are they willing to do the work to get the job. So here we are at the last phase of the HireWorks process where we go through the whole selection decision process and make a job offer and uh, hopefully convince the individual to accept your offer even if you can't match the compensation or benefits package of your competitors. So let's, let's talk about that. So in step one of phase three, you're going to hold a second round candidate assessment meeting to compare your notes with your interview team, and you're going to decide who you're going to make an offer to. So I also want you to remember you need to follow up and do this quickly because candidates will often take the first offer they get, right, for fear of not getting any other offers. And 
In other words, if you snooze, you lose. You need to not sit around for two weeks to wait to call this candidate assessment meeting and doing that comparison of notes and making your decision. And as a side note, if your decision is going to take you a while, I want you to just remember candidates are always complaining about poor communication they receive from employers. So I strongly recommend that you keep in touch with all your candidates uh, you're interested in and especially the one you're making an offer to or if you think that's the one you're going to make an offer to, you, you need to show them that you're interested in them even if you haven't reached a decision. So call them up and let them know you're still working on it and you hope to have a decision shortly. And this will show respect and you can almost guarantee your competitors are not going to do this. So it can really help you influence your preferred candidate's decision. And again, you're trying to make sure that now that you know who you want, that they want you. So uh, make sure you, if you can't make a quick decision and make them an offer, that you tell them you're working on it and haven't forgot about them. So now, after you've made your selection decision, you're going to write your offer letter and you're going to write what I call a package of value offer letter to that selected candidate. And this is where you're going to use your knowledge of the candidate as a person to make your offer one to legally accept. And the best way to do that is to review the candidate's Big Five Assessment Personality Profile Report to see what the core motivations of the candidate are. You know, for example, if the candidate really likes autonomy on the job, then emphasize in your letter how the candidate will be making their own decisions in this role and that they will have a large degree of autonomy. If the candidate likes working alone, we'll point out how they can work remotely away from the office if their role allows for that. So I think you get the idea. You'll look at the personality profile report, pick out a few things that they seem to have a strong emphasis on and make sure that you emphasize those attributes as part of the work environment they will enjoy if they come to work for you. So remember, money is less of a motivator than you might think, especially with the Gen Z and millennial uh, workforce that's out there. So try to make sure you meet some of the psychological needs of the candidate. And if you do that, you'll increase your chances of the candidate accepting your offer. So after you write that letter, and I can't emphasize this enough again, you want to call the selected candidate as soon as possible and present your offer verbally. And if you can't reach them, well, leave a short voicemail with the notification that you have an offer for them and that you're going to be sending it to them in writing by email. So you can ask them to call you back at your personal cell phone number might be a nice touch. Believe me, they're not going to bother you in the future by having your personal cell phone number, but you can tell them that it's your personal cell phone number, and that way they'll, they'll know that you're taking an exceptional step to reach them. And you just need to remember that you're trying to sell them on coming to work for you. So act excited about having them join your company, and that'll make them excited about accepting your offer as well. So the last step really is now you're going to onboard that new employee. And this, I believe, is the key part of retention, that if they don't have a good onboarding experience, they're not going to stay with you long term. So let's talk about the onboarding. You know, the hiring process really doesn't end with the offer letter. You, you need to be intentional about your onboarding process for every new employee, and especially with virtual positions in this new hybrid work environment as these new hires can have a harder time feeling connected with their new team and your company if they're not in the office every day engaging with people. So for example, well before their first day, you're gonna to wanna to email your new hire and give them an agenda of what their onboarding is going to be like, what the training timeline will be, what different meeting invites that they're going to have so they know what to expect when they go live in their seat if they're a remote person or if they come into the office and they're going to work on site all the time they'll know what to expect 
You're also going to want to make sure if they're remotely working from home that they have all the needed supplies and equipment they need. So you're going to want to have it all shipped to their house before their start date, right? So in this last step of the hiring process, you're going to learn some more creative ways that you can expose your internal and remote employees to your company culture, get them excited, and um, you know, give them a good onboarding experience. So we've put together another form that you'll be able to use over and over that will give you a checklist of things you can do to get people on board. And um, if you look through it, it, it covers day one, week one, first 30 days, 60 and 90 days. And it's a pretty good reminder and checklist of things that will make the onboarding experience much better. And you really, I can't emphasize it enough that in my experience, the onboarding process at most businesses is an often overlooked and an ad hoc process that can leave the new employee feeling overwhelmed and frustrated to the point they leave after the first week. And I've seen that happen at a big medical office and I've seen it, all, it happen with an engineer at an engineering firm where the person didn't stay more than a week. So I would highly recommend that you pay attention to the onboarding process and, and don't make that the weak link in your overall process. So now you've done it. You've got the offer letter out. You've got the onboarding plan together. And when that new employee gets on board, you're going to want to introduce them to everyone and celebrate, uh, announce it with an email to everyone, tell them what their you know, name, title, position, um, all those things. Take them around and introduce them. You, you got the checklist, but you've made it. You've gotten through all three phases of the hire works process. And I think you'll find that if you do this, you're going to have a process that's repeatable that people are going to uh, remember and follow. And uh, I forgot to mention this, but there's also the opportunity to make the hiring process part of an ISO 9000 uh, quality manual. Uh, if you are doing work for uh, any aerospace work or if you're trying to get your ISO 9001 certification, there's a big portion in there that talks about personnel records and job descriptions and things like that. And the hire works process can easily make your hiring process part of your overall quality process. So again, congratulations. And that's the end of the formal part of this webinar. Um, I want to go into some of the frequently asked questions now. And that's the way we can wrap it up with some answers to some practical issues that uh, most people ask about this process. So let's go through a couple of them. So number one, you know, everybody wants to know, well, how many companies use personality assessments and testing? So Psychology Today did a survey in September of 2022 that their findings report that 80% of the Fortune 500 companies are currently using personality assessments as part of their hiring process today. So eight out of 10 Fortune 500 custom, uh, companies are still using personality assessments, which leads to the second question is, are pre-employment personality testing or assessments legal in the United States? Well, the answer is yes, that's because they're not illegal. No federal, state, or local law prohibits the proper use of pre-employment testing. And 8 out of 10 Fortune 500 companies are using them. So this should never be a concern about using personality assessments, cognitive assessments, attitude assessments, whatever kind of other testing you want to do. If you have some technical skills assessments you want to do, uh, there is nothing wrong with using them as long as you don't use them to discriminate against anyone. Next commonly asked question is, can candidates trick the system? Well, number one, 
I think it's important that you remember personality assessments are not a pass-fail type of assessment. They're, they're really, it's hard to trick a system where there's no pass-fail grade, right? It's strictly measuring the degree to which someone exhibits a, a typical or particular uh, trait or behavior. So, you know, it's really hard to trick a system like that. But even if someone tried, the good impression scale that I talked about as part of the big five assessment software provides a good indication as to whether the candidate was being honest in their responses and was open or if they tried to exaggerate and disguise their responses. So, again, the system really can't be tricked because there's nothing to trick. It's just going to measure what the candidate's exact behavioral trait is. All right, the next question is, is psychometrics knowledge required to understand the Big Five assessment reports? Well, no, there's no requirement to complete any kind of formal training or possess any expert qualifications. Our reports are short and to the point. They're graphical, plus they have a narrative portion of the report that'll show you how the candidate fits to your requirements and where you need to probe deeper during the interview process. So if you use the Big Five assessment software, you'll be up and running on the same day with all the quick start guides and brief outline tutorials we have. And um, another thing is in most implementations of the HireWorks process, the CEO or general manager or you know, a smaller business, perhaps it's the owner, but they usually designate someone as a uh, super user of the Big Five assessment software. And that individual can be your go-to person that will help you if you have any questions about using the software, um, if you're an actual user, or how to interpret and read the reports if you're just a hiring team member that only gets access to the final reports. A question that's often asked is, should I share the assessment results with a candidate? Well, I wouldn't recommend it uh, initially. Uh, typically, what's done is you can talk about them during the interview, but the actual job fit report and the attitude report, we typically don't want shared with the candidate because what could happen is they'll end up arguing over the results with you, and you really don't need that. You just need to remind them that they're not a test and there's no pass or fail grading right? They only reveal levels of personality traits that are required for the job. So what they do get access to is some of the other reports about um, career paths and uh, leadership potential and other areas that do get shared with the candidates. So if they take the assessment and they've registered for their big five assessments account, they will get access to reports that describe their personality. But those reports are not the job fit report that shows how they measure up versus other people that have taken the assessments for that particular job role. And I think I just answered this one, uh, but another frequently asked question is, how do we access the candidate reports? Well, your hiring manager will send you a copy of the reports as a PDF file by email typically or perhaps you will be given access to the software and you can access the uh, reports directly. But either way, you know, you'll be able to get the reports as soon as the assessments are done or as soon as the hiring manager decides to make them available to you. Uh, and lastly, an often asked question is, well, how long does it take to implement the HireWorks process? Well, Initially, it's going to take some time and energy as you roll it out to all your hiring managers, but the amount of time you're going to save over the long term from having a solid set of, of job requirements and hiring tools that your business can use over and over, that's going to potentially save you hundreds of hours over the course of an average year by not having to hire for the same position over and over again and remaking the wheel. So, with the helps of a HireWorks Pro Coach, most HireWorks process implementations can be done in as little as 90 days. At least 
to get you where that first job description and job success profile is written and where you have all the tools in place and the initial training of the initial team, whoever that team is. If it's an interview team for a particular job, one job, well, that's a very quick ramp up because you've got one hiring manager and maybe you know two or three hiring team individuals that need to learn the process. And then once that is learned by those individuals, you can repeat it you know, over and over, and um, then everything goes faster from there. So can be done in as little as 90 days, and um, I would be there to help you and see you successfully implement the process. So I believe that's it. Who do you contact if you have more questions? Well, you can text me or call me at my phone at 330-800-1863, or you can email me at hireworks at arcadiumgroup.com. If you'd like to schedule some time on my calendar to have a discussion, uh, you can just go to http colon slash slash call with jw.com and that'll take you to my calendar. And if you want to learn more about the HireWorks process, uh, you can go to hireworksusa.com and on my website there, it'll tell you all about the HireWorks process. So that's how you can reach me. I would look forward to talking with you anytime. And uh, for this webinar, uh, that's all for now. So I wish you a great day and great success in any hiring you do.